profession especially in the medical field yeah if you have what happens what happens if you ask them how their day was how their job is how they feel about their job usually within 10 seconds 30 seconds they start to cry right <laughs> IT, IT in the medical uh, in the in the medical field it's a mess and here to talk about why, how, and how we maybe fix it for future products, we have on stage Bettina Neuhaus. So please welcome her with a very warm round of applause. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for being here on this very lovely sunny day and spend your time in this tent. Um, yeah, I will talk about medical software and the regulation. Um, let's see our itinerary of our journey. Um, we have five parts, or basically four parts. Uh, first, I give you the intention of this talk, would we'll be very short. Then uh, we'll take a discovery tour. Where is medical software, in what devices, or maybe without a device? Um, then a short disaster tourism tour, uh, spectacular fails in recent times, um, because I want to give you the idea why it is important, the part that I will talk about afterwards, and that is uh, the regulatory part, and what this means if you have an idea for a medical product. So, yeah. Let's start. And the fine print, of course, a few references, contact into uh, info and so on. So, first part. Uh, this is a field trip, not a study tour, which means I will not go into the details of every regulation because, first of all, that would take a few days. And um, also, I want to give you an idea this is from a European Union perspective, but uh, it will give you an idea even if you're in other parts of the world. So, uh, if you are a regulatory expert, you may not hear much new stuff, but if you are doing regular IT, then you can get the idea what to do when you want to go into the medical field. Yeah. Next part, where can we find medical software? You have first idea, idea that you have will most likely be the pacemakers, implants, ventilators, and so on. I will not, I will not read out all the, the slides. Um, you have external parts that don't touch your body, and you have secondary parts that are not directly in contact, that receive and send data and do stuff with that. And also the mobile apps, uh, which can be free to use or may also be officially regulated medical devices. Um, yeah, so just talked about that, the prescription apps. And also you may have, for example, the very simple ones or the very complicated ones, IA-based, supporting, for example, skin conditions, making a first hint for a diagnose, which will then be screened by medical personnel. Um, all of this is medical software and all of this is regulated. Um, yeah, and then we have the cases of doubt. For example, clinical information systems. Those are the systems that run in hospitals, and some of them try to cover everything from administrative uh, tasks, so getting the patient data, where is that patient, in what room, and so on, but also diagnostic info. And here's the grayscale. Um, if it's, for example, the software that focuses more on the uh, diagnostic part, 
then it may be most probably a medical product and needs to be regulated. Of course, there is a lot of discussion and the manufacturers, uh, manufacturers are often not so happy uh, when they are told this is a medical product you need to get certified because that means a lot of time and money, but also a lot of safety. Yeah, and then um, I want to bring to your attention, I mean, as IT people, you will already know that, but those medical devices uh, comprise of many parts, of course. Mm, often you have a part of hardware, there you have the, the, the firmware, of course, the uh, software for analysis and so on. So the, the, the example I've taken here is loosely based on a lab analyzer. And what's important is that all of this can come from different suppliers. And they all need to comply. And who is responsible in the end? That's the manufacturer. That's the one whose name is on the packaging. And that's the one who tells the agencies, um, the official agencies, here's the medical product I want to uh, enter the market. And that manufacturer has to make sure that each supplier is compliant. So, yeah, that's important. And also, uh, on the lower left, you see the third-party applications. Um, of course, you will not write everything from scratch. You will not write most likely an operation system. Sometimes you do, but often you don't. And um, you take third-party software. That is called here a soup, a software of unknown provenance, which means you haven't written the code yourself, but you still have to make sure that it is safe for your medical project, uh, product. So you have to take the measures. Sometimes this, uh, this supplier of, for example, the operating system is also certified for medical product, but often is not. And then you have to take measures to show that it is st still safe. So you have to consider time and effort uh, for this as well. So, what can possibly go wrong? Let's take a very short tour, uh, disaster tour uh, for spectacular fails in recent times. We have here, first thing, um, uh, I've taken a look at the FDA database, you can find the link below, um, just the cases of 2021. So, you can see here, it's a lot. I can't tell you how many, because the database would just return a maximum of 500. Um, so the class one recalls for mostly harmless product, that was just 26. And most of those were mislabeling. So, um, for example, there is um, um, a lab, um, oh, what's that called? Let me check my notes. Oh, it's for in vitro diag uh, diagnostic agents. So, so maybe there was a different agent in uh, this soup, so to uh, say, uh, but it still works very fine. It's, it's not a problem, it's just mislabeling. That's um, cause for a class one recall. Um, the class two is slightly more um, dangerous, possibly. Um, and there were more than 500. I can't tell you how many, just very many recalls where something went wrong and they had to recall. And then we have the class three um, recalls. That means they, in case of a failure, this can lead to permanent harm or even death. And this has happened. I, I will show you example, an example on the next slides. So this happened 179 times just the last year, just FDA. And I said in the beginning, um, I'm referring to um, EU regulations, but frankly, the FDA a, a seems to me much more transparent and accessible, so I took these data. Um, yeah, first example, 
We have the Dexcom glucose monitoring system that was or is for uh, diabetes patients. They had to recall more than 250,000 units. Um, it's a system where we have a small implant measuring your blood sugar levels and um, a receiver. And the measurement was just fine, but the alarm didn't sound. So if your blood sugar level was too high or too low, if you didn't check actively, you didn't know. Um, and that can, of course, lead to death. And they had to recall all their devices um, distributed between 2012 and 2000, 2016. You can imagine what that costs and uh, what that means logistically. Then we have an air, uh, infusion pump module for uh, high volume infusion. And they had to recall uh, almost three quarters of a million units uh, because they had multiple errors. They, they weren't described in detail. And um, this could have caused an interruption in infusion. And here is the really serious case. They had at least 55 um, reported injuries. So uh, we don't know if there were more, maybe. And they had one reported death. So this can happen if all the procedures fail. And there are a lot of procedures. You can see that later. Uh, also, a very nice example. I, I love it so much because there was a very interesting talk uh, on the last CCC camp. The link is down here. I highly recommend to watch it. Um, this was um, a pacemaker and could be hacked. And you could change the heart rate of the patients. Or you can drain the battery um, quickly, quicker than they wanted to. And interestingly, um, the, the manufacturer tried to say for, for some time, no, it works, it's not true, but, uh, well, just watch that, that talk. It's really good what they did. In the end, they had to recall all these. Oh, and, and one example that's not on the slide, a recent uh, thing I saw in Germany, um, mobile application, so wouldn't cause any death or something, but, uh, well, you probably have heard that before. They had um, user IDs, numerical order, so you can just guess uh, just a number and you're in the account of another patient. Voila. I think this has happened not only in medical software, but it still happens. Okay, so these were the examples, and now the biggest part is uh, we take a look into the regulations and what that means for your product. Let's say you have a good idea for a medical product, because that's what I will focus on. There are other types I will show you on the next slide. We, so the focus is medical product EU, but also applies in big parts to other kinds of products. So, first you have to determine, is it a medical product? And the first question is, is it for human use? Because if you have something that heals cancer of cats, that is fantastic, but it's not a, um, a medical product in the regulatory sense. It has to be for human use. And then, the next thing is the intended purpose. And the intended purpose is what you say it is. So you often will see in manuals that it, is, it says, this is not for medical use. Well, then it's not a medical product because the manufacturer tells you, you don't use this for medical use. So you can decide a little bit if your product is for medical use or not, if you have to follow the regulations or not. And if you don't, then it's, an, it's not a medical product and it can't be used in that field, of course. Okay, so, um, also, yeah, is it a lifestyle product or something like that? Then it's not a medical product, but if it is, for example, it is on the, on the human body, somewhere in touch with the human body, 
like uh, diagnose systems or the implants that I just talked, uh, talked about, then it falls under the medical device regulation. Um, if it's not in direct contact, lab material and so on, analyzers somewhere else, not in direct contact with the human body, then um, it, uh, the, the in vitro diagnostic um, device regulation is the one to go for. And then you have the pharmaceuticals. That's a whole different part. And there we have the ICH and the GMP. And ICH sounds so short, I will just read out what that means. That's the International Council for Harmonizing of Technical Requirements of the Pharmaceuticals for Human Use, ICH. <laughs> I will leave that out today, and I will focus on the medical device regulation, but, for example, the in vitro diagnostic regulation is more than 80% the same. It just uh, focuses more on um, calibration, that you get the, the right results, on weighing, measuring, and so on. Um, yeah, next thing. You will hear this a few times more during this talk, documentation. Because get ready for a lot of documentation, which is very important. Uh, I will get to that later. You begin to compile your technical documentation with, a, with a, what is a bunch of documents. And this from, goes from the very start of your, your project until the end. Um, yeah, you document everything that I will mention on the following slides and even more. You can reference the documents to each other, so you don't have to write things twice, because then it's also maybe a cause of failure because you, you uh, update one document and not the other, so link them to each other, saves time and um, is easier later. What, what we do uh, in, in our projects, in my company, is in every project we have a regulatory expert just for that purpose. And I highly recommend to do that because um, I have to say I'm not that expert. I'm certified, I know all the stuff, but I have a lot of things to do and I am I'm very grateful that I have one person just for the regulatory part, make sure uh, from morning to evening that everything is compliant. Um, yeah, you have to get um, a declaration of conformity, you know that CE sign that's everywhere, and uh, if it's a harmless device, class one, we get to that, um, then you can apply that to uh, your, your set, not to yourself, but you can apply that yourself and write the declaration of conformity. But if your product has a higher risk, um, then you need a notified body to audit you and give you this E sign. And um, yeah, it's important to also plan ahead because that takes a lot of time. You can't uh, tell those people, okay, I'm ready, please come tomorrow. Um, usually it takes, I don't know, in, in, in our projects, nine, 12 weeks or more for the first talk to those people. So plan ahead. Um, yeah, then we come to this class that I've already mentioned. Um, the classification of your product depends on um, the health risk. So, um, and you have different, different classification types for medical products in the EU, you have 1, 2A, 2B, and 3. In the US, you have 1, 2, and 3. Um, for in vitro devices, you have A, B, C, D. And there's also a different one for software. So just look it up. If you find your product, uh, product then um, yeah, you can spend a lot of time and discussion to find this classification. Um, software running on those devices, if you have hardware, they have their own classification on top. And standalone software, if there's no hardware, they are considered, you can also look that up in the regulation, 
as an active medical device, and active means it needs a power source or it has a power source. So implants like a new knee joint, that's not an active device because it doesn't have a power source. Um, yeah, then you um, do the risk assessment. So risk, risk management is one of the biggest parts of medical uh, software projects. Um, you take a look, can your product cause pa harm to patients, to users or to others? And how serious might that be? And how likely is it? And then you create a risk matrix, and you, you take all the reasonable measures uh, to lower those risks. You have to describe this. And this is also um, yeah, a topic for a lot of discussion. Uh, where is my pro project or product? Um, what does the, the notified body say? What do the uh, agencies say? Is this a real class or not? So this is not a thing of, I find this, I say this, done. There's a lot of movement and discussion here. So also prepare for a lot of time um, yeah, to find that uh, risk. Sorry. Um, Yeah, a few examples. What are those classes? Also, uh, uh, again, this is EU medical device regulation. Um, the class one is the mostly harmless things like a, a band aid. Um, nothing can happen, mainly, or still can, but unlikely. So then you have the clay, uh, class two A and B. Um, they interact with the body or maybe enter the body. Um, like, like hearing aids, uh, aids, infusion pumps, and so on. They can, um, har they can cause harm um, for, permanent, uh, for, for a temporary time, and um, they have a medium risk. And the class uh, three products are the ones that are permanently implanted to your body or interact with a central body, a nervous system, for example, and uh, if they fail, they can cause permanent harm or death. So that's the highest class, and you have to take the most measures and get the most auditing and, and so on. Um, yeah, what to do next? You have to establish um, a quality management system, which describes the processes that you will adhere to and document everything. Um, you are obliged to do so from, from class two um, up, but even for the class one, they recommend to do this. So, um, yeah, this is to, to make sure that you have all the pro processes there to ensure you, you comply and, um, yeah, practically uh, know what you are doing and can document that. Uh, the alternative is, if you're a small company or maybe even just one person, which I also had before, you can find someone to do all this. Maybe they already have a um, management system, the quality management system. Maybe they are already qualified. And um, then you can also get them in as a partner because you say, okay, I want to focus on the, on the software or on whatever, and um, you can find someone. But then this partner has to act as the legal manufacturer, so their name will be on the packaging, and um, yeah, just decide if that's the way to go for you or not. Um, yeah, also you have to, um, to verify that your software actually works. And this means um, for the class one um, products, you have to um, make a clinical evaluation. So check literature, write down uh, what you found and why your, your product will work. And for classes two and B, you uh, have to do a clinical evaluation, so basically the same, but you have to use clinical data or a clinical trial, which is, um, yeah, more work. 
And for class three, you have to conduct a clinical, full-scale clinical study, evaluate that, and uh, document everything to show that your product is effective. Yeah, my favorite word is traceability, because that is basically um, one main point for all the medical products. Traceability, you have um, three kinds of. I will focus on the first one. Um, the traceability of product requirements from the requirements to the testing in the end, which means, or I will come to that later. Um, also, we have um, traceability for, the, uh, for measuring the in vitro devices. So does your device um, show the, the right results? Is, the results? is it calibrated? You have to show that all the way and um, through the whole life cycle of your project, product. Sorry. And also, uh, they have the logistics. So in case something fails, you, have to, you need to have the traceability um, yeah, back to the first supplier. If something fails, for example, there is one piece of hardware um, in, in your medical device with, from some supplier, you have to know, uh, okay, where, where is my project, uh, product that uh, has this batch from this supplier? that you have to recall. So that's also um, logistics traceability. But let's take a look at the first one. Um, software, mainly software, but also hardware uh, traceability in your project. Classical thing is to do a V model planning here. Hello, project managers. Um, which basically means that from the very first part for the very first planning up to the last uh, and you have to show where all the requirements are. So looking at, for example, a software code, um, there is a line of code somewhere, it's audited, you have to show why this line of code is there. Where is the requirement? Um, because, um, because of that, this line of code was written. And also, where is the test um, that relates to this code? So you have to have this chain of traceability throughout the whole project to make sure that there is no code that is just fancy and undocumented Easter eggs or something like that that can't happen in a medical product. And that's all, of course, for the safety reasons. I just shown you that no disaster happens uh, like the ones I've shown you just, uh, just now. Um, okay, next one. Uh, oh, I already said that, I guess. <laughs> uh, let me see. <laughs> yeah, so result is document, document, document. Verify, validate, so are you actually uh, building your product the right way? And also, uh, can users um, um, reach the goal, the, the intended goal? And um, yeah, test, document, and document. Um, yeah, OK. All this documentation can happen um, even, uh, either on paper, the classical way, um, and you have a lot of files sitting there, and for each change in your software, for each new release, you have to print out the newer versions. They have to be signed, uh, sealed, and delivered. Um, or you can use uh, electronic systems for that. We just heard about, in the talk before, about um, the digital signatures. That's a very good uh, thing you will need for those uh, electronic documentation systems. There are a bunch, they are working, and uh, they are specialized in making sure that you have the traceability that you need, so that everything is linked to each other and you can find each item on the way, and also um, that it can't be changed later, um, so you have your safe uh, documentation there. Yeah, you need to be audited uh, on a regular basis. Um, again, 
that depends on your, the class of your product. If it's a class one product, then you have the audit from time to time. And if it's a three, class three product, you have to get re-audited every year. Um, if you uh, deal with uh, ISO 9001 um, certificates and um, audits, you will know how this works because uh, it's quite similar. Um, oh, okay. I see. I'm, I'm quite good with the time. <laughs> uh, okay. So, um, let's say you have everything ready. You have spent the last one and a half years planning, documenting, talking to the notified bodies, getting everything uh, and encoding everything and testing everything. Um, then you have to register your product with the official body in your country to enter the market. In Germany, for example, that's the bee farm. Um, the Bundesinstitut für Arzneimittel und Medizinprodukte, uh, Federal Institute for Drugs and Medical Devices, because you can't just start to sell something, you have to reg register it first. And then uh, you have to start with a long time market observation. What does that mean? That means uh, of course, you have to watch what happens with your product and you have to have all the processes in line to receive uh, complaints, failures and so on, call back the products uh, and so on. But you also have to take a look constantly at other products on the market. Are there new procedures or are there findings in other project, uh, products that might apply to yours as well? Uh, you are obliged to do so, and if you learn something that might um, have an influence on your product, you have to check and maybe um, apply uh, uh, some changes. So you can't just sell it like a normal product and, and wait for complaints or something. You have to actively monitor the market and um, yeah, uh, take measures if something shows up. Um, yeah, if something shows up, you have to notify to, to, to uh, notify the notified body or the institutions that there is something um, in in Germany, for example, it's the beer farm. In the USA, it's the FDA. That is where I got all the numbers uh, in the beginning, um, because they need to know, and then they need to distribute the information that there is something going on and. Um, you have to take measures to, again, lower the risks. Because maybe if there is a critical failure uh, and you are not able to recall everything at once, then you have to send out information what to do. Uh, sometimes it's just read this label and uh, know that it's wrong, or here's a software update and here is how to install it until we deliver the new product to you. Um, or in the worst case, it is well, just stop using at once, because it may cause death. And, well, this is uh, a difficult thing, because just yesterday I was talking to my colleagues over at the Hack the Health Village, and they said basically, well, in Europe, yes, they, you, you say, okay, stop using this product, we give you a new one. But if you are in countries like uh, South America, or, or, I don't know, India, maybe it's not so easy because there is not a quick replacement and they really want to use it, uh, although uh, it might be risky because there's just no alternative. And, um, yeah, I've, <laughs> it's just, I just heard, I have no link for that, um, that there were guys specializing in making uh, the devices work even longer even if they are risky, because they just don't have an alternative. So, yeah, it's, it's sometimes it's difficult uh, to see what the right decision is, but officially, of course, if there's um, a serious risk, then you have to recall uh, all of that. Okay, 
So I said in the beginning, I won't bother you with all the uh, regulations, but here is your guide. Take that with you if you want to start a, a medical product. Um, these are the most relevant regulations. It's not complete, of course, but it will give you a start. And all of this is well documented, of course. It's regulations and norms. Um, so let's take a look. We have the, the quality aspects. I think I was talking mostly about that today. That's the um, ISO 13485, and ISO tells you it's international, it's not only um, EU. That deals with the medical device uh, quality management system. Sounds easy, but there's a bunch of um, regulations behind this or, or definitions and so on. Um, then one aspect that I didn't talk about that much today, or at all, almost, is usability. Uh, medical device usability, and uh, this means that uh, by, by design, uh, does your product work, does it cause no harm, and can people reach the goal they are intended to reach. You have the software lifecycle processes, um, that is such a bunch of things uh, described to you what to do to develop plan, develop, test, roll out your medical device. And the big part of the risk management. As I said before, um, this is a big part of discussion. So prepare for spending quite a lot of time to find the class for your product and discuss with people and show your measures and then discuss again and then uh, settle on a class at last, I guess. Um, yeah, and then IT security for medical software products and for, for health uh, products in general. So this does not uh, only apply to certified medical products, but also to health and lifestyle products. So if you want to go that way, um, check this regulation as well. Okay. Um, yeah, and uh, not all of these are harmonized, I have here, so they are not completely agreed upon between all the uh, different country institutions. Um, so check for your country uh, if they apply um, or if there are sort of differences. Okay, and I think with that, I'm almost at the end. Um, I have here a bunch of links that I used for uh, compiling this talk. Um, and also, I'd like to thank my colleague Milena, who is the uh, validation or the regulatory expert on my current project. Uh, so thank you, Milena, very much for uh, saving <laughs> a few errors on this first version. Um, yeah, that's all. Uh, I'm Bettina, as, um, as I said before, happy to get in contact and, um, oh, there's one little thing I'd like to mention. I don't know if you have seen my, my post on Twitter about the multi-tool that I brought. That's a bit unrelated, but it's a bit of language fun. So I have a few of these uh, multi-tools for people in, ne <laughs> in need of a tool or a bottle opener. I think that's the most important one. And I promise to pronounce a German word because there is an explanation here. Um, and uh, there is a Phillips screwdriver on this multi-tool. And the German ver word for Phillips screwdriver is Kreuzschlitzschraubendreher. So, <laughs> thank you very much. And uh, yeah. We have a few minutes for questions, if you like. Thanks. Thank you, Bettina. That was a very well-documented talk. Thank you for that. <laughs> um, we already have people lining up at the microphones. Excellent. Please, sir, step forward, come close to the microphone, and ask your question. Hi. 
Uh, hi, thanks for the talk. I'm afraid I missed the beginning, so if, uh, if you already covered this, excuse me. Um, can you say something about the permissibility of using AI-based algorithms in medical products? Yeah. So if I'm using like a neural network to identify cells, can I certify that? Because it's kind of a black box. I don't know what's going on. Uh, yeah, but it's still, um, I, I mentioned that very briefly uh, as part of where might medical software be. And um, as soon as it's part of medical software, then you need to put this into, um, yeah, all of these regulatory processes and um, validate and, and verify that it works exactly and follow all the procedures from the, the medical regulations, yeah. And I know it's hard <laughs> because, yeah, as you said, it's a black box, yeah. Thank you for your talk. Um, you discussed that there are, uh, you discussed the concept of soup within your regulatory uh, environment where you have third party components. Mm -hmm. And there have been a lot of discussions with the open source community in combination with medical devices and medical suppliers. Mm -hmm. So my question is, is like, and this is also in other regulatory industries, like how do you, for example, for the Linux kernel uh, validate like, yeah, you have this user called Happy Banana, which made some driver updates and we have some yeah, singing uh, monkey on the other part. So how does that come together in the medical industry that you can certify such a thing? Because you're not building your own operating system, you're running on, for example, a Linux system in certain cases. So yeah. how, do you, how, how does that work? Can you give a little bit more insight on that one? Well, one thing is to see if already others are using it, <laughs> of course, and have done some work for you there in advance. And uh, then, uh, well, you might have to audit uh, the software and really look into it and check uh, if it's safe, if there are um, risks inside the code, for example. Um, also, risk assessment. Um, what, what part is this in your medical product? Um, what kind of harm uh, can it cause? I didn't go into that, uh, how, to, how to do that. You, have, you can do a preliminary hazard analysis for this, for example, uh, an FMEA, I uh, might have heard that before. And yeah, you might have to do this for uh, soups as well. Uh, if they are well known, it might be easier. So if you're using a Windows operating system, I think um, nobody will require you to audit this in all depth. But if you're using some brand new library, then yeah, you have to do that. Okay, but also for existing, if you for example look at the Linux kernel, mm -hmm. that gets updated quite often, etc. So how yeah. do you keep that basically on one hand secure and the other hand, <laughs> yeah, you got that certification there. Yeah, I mean, f first of all, one part of your documentation is a list of soups. So you always have to document uh, all kinds of soup that you are using in your software. Uh, so you have to write down, I am using Linux kernel, this and that version. And um, if it's a brand new one, uh, I guess then you would also have to audit that. You can't just take it. No one has, of course, someone has tested it, but not in the way for a medical product. Then, yeah, you have to do this if you're the first one. But also, yeah, if you're using um, Linux or some library or everything uh, that touches your software, you have to list it. You have to make sure you keep it updated all the time. and. With every release, um, you also have to update your list of soups. Is there something new? Is there a new version of, the, of that library or that kernel? Thank you. Next one, please. Oh, microphone is oh, off. Still mute? Okay, now it is. So, here. Um, so thank you for your talk. Um, would any software that a user interacts with basically be a class one product because if it has any impact on health. Um, I'm not sure if you get your... Uh, okay, back. if you have a software that yeah. impacts, impacts the user's health anyway, would yeah. it be a class one product? For example, an app, mobile app. 
Um, oh, uh, that's actually a good example because uh, that was one discussion that I had with my colleague Milena. The information that I had is that medical products, uh, medical apps, in Germany at least, uh, until recently mostly were class one products. But with the newest version and with the MDA, uh, MDR, sorry, um, they are now mostly uh, class 2A. So that shows you again, there is a lot of movement uh, and uh, the regulation is still new, um, so it's not fixed. Next, next one, please. Thank you very much for the, uh, for the talk. Um, back in the beginning of the pandemic, the UK government at some point uh, asked companies to come up with medical ventilators right then and there. Mm -hmm. And the Dyson company said, well, we'll design one in 30 days. Do you remember that? And was that realistic at any point in time? Uh, design the product? Yes, maybe. But don't, you don't get that certified in that time. It's not possible, I guess. Because everything I just talked about, you have to do. And ventilators, they are serious. Uh, I'm not sure. I think they are at least class uh, 2B or something like that. Don't want to say something wrong here. So you have to comply with a lot of regulations and, and follow a lot of processes. I don't think it's re uh, realistic. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, well, again, thank you for your talk. I was wondering, you talked about if there's, uh, you bring the product on the market that you constantly have to keep in check with any developments in the field. Mm -hmm. Let's say there is a development and you find that you have to update your product. Do you have to go through the entire regulation process again, or is it just parts? Uh, well, um, <laughs> depends. <laughs> if there is a new feature that might cause uh, a change in uh, chances, but also risks, you have to check with each change, is there a change in my risk? And if there is a serious change in my risk and I don't have the measurements to lower that again, the possibility that it actually happens, um, then you might have to change the class of your uh, product. And then you have to change the processes and uh, um, apply a bunch of more um, measures. So with almost everything, it depends. Yeah, you have to check, and if there's all, uh, a small change, maybe you have to update your documents. If it's a bigger change, uh, then you have to change classes and do a lot of more things. Thank <laughs> so. you. So, Bettina, uh, yes. where can people find you for further questions? Where to find? Where, to fi where, where can we find you if we have further questions? Yeah, uh, uh, right now, after, after this talk, you can find me around the tent, I don't know, somewhere nice and easy, at the Hack the Health Village, if the music is not too loud, because I found out that we're <laughs> unfortunately between two. I mean, they have fun, nothing against that, but... <laughs> they play still near Geraffe. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Bettina. We're out of time, so please give a very warm applause to Bettina. Thank you.